And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Accessibility Room by Room. This webinar and telelearning series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. My name is Brian Thompson. I'm the Programs Manager for Can Do MS, and I'll be your moderator this evening. For those of you new to Can Do MS, we transform lives by delivering educational programs on exercise, nutrition, and symptom management to inspire and motivate long-lasting change for those with MS and their families to help them thrive. Please visit the Can Do MS website, mscando.org, to learn more about Can Do MS's online and nationwide in-person programs. Can Do MS is excited to partner with the National MS Society to bring you 15 webinars in 2017. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other society programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. We will save about 20 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. You can submit questions by using the question chat box feature found in your control panel which will be in the lower right-hand corner of uh, the rectangle that should be appearing on your screen. Uh, we certainly encourage you to be part of this interactive discussion. For those of you joining us by phone, all lines have been muted because this is being recorded. Uh, so unfortunately, the only way to submit a question is by logging on to the webinar. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be archived on Can Do MS's and the National MS Society's websites. You can also download a copy of tonight's presentation as well as an article co-authored by tonight's speakers uh, by looking at the handout uh, bar on uh, the rectangle on your screen. Finally, a copy of the presentation will also be available in, the, in a follow-up email that will be sent out immediately following tonight's webinar. Again, you will receive a copy of tonight's slides and you can go back and view an archived version of the presentation on the Can Do MS website. Finally, I want to inform you that we are using a new platform, GoToWebinar, which allows us to provide videos of some of the adaptations and exercises that our speakers will be discussing tonight. While we are looking forward to providing a more dynamic learning experience tonight, I want to forewarn that some of the videos may be slow or choppy on your computers, especially as we have uh, over 1,000 people registered tonight. Unfortunately, these type of glitches are inevitable, but we will roll with the punches and we will appreciate your patience in advance. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening. Stephanie Nolan graduated from Elizabethtown College in 2009 with her master's degree in occupational therapy. She practiced as a pediatric OT for four years and has since been working with adults with neurological rehabilitation in Norfolk, Virginia. Stephanie was recently a presenter at the Can Do MS Take Charge program, as well as an observer at the Can Do program. Stephanie will be joined by Mandy Warwick this evening. Mandy earned her bachelor's in exercise of science from Nebraska Wesleyan U University and her doctorate of physical therapy from the University of Nebraska. Mandy serves patients with neurolo neurological conditions with an emphasis on multiple sclerosis at the Horizon Rehabilitation Center in Omaha. She is also active in many national and local MS organizations, including the National MS Society's Clinical Content Advisory Team, as well as serving as a consulting coordinator for Can Do MS. So it's my honor to turn things over to Mandy and Stephanie. Great. Thanks, Brian. This is Mandy, so you know my voice. And then, Stephanie, do you want to say hello so that they can distinguish our voices? Sure. This is Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Great. Welcome to the webinar. We'll go ahead and get started. And when you're ready, Brian, go ahead. Thank you. So do you have the keys to your home? We are starting, want you to start thinking about ways to make your home more accessible. So we have a few posing questions to get you thinking about this. Are there places in your home that potentially are off limits? Maybe rooms or areas that are difficult to navigate or that you feel may be unsafe. Do you feel like your home life is confined to a few rooms? Is your life limited to maybe your bathroom, your bedroom, your living room, or your kitchen? 
maybe going to the basement is too much because of fatigue or balance challenges. Or perhaps meals have um, moved from the kitchen table to maybe TV trays in the living room because eating in the kitchen is just simply too much work or it's unsafe. Um, perhaps you wish you could do more independently in your home and rely less on your loved ones. If your answer is yes to any of these questions, or these questions perhaps spark additional questions or thoughts in your mind, then we are certainly glad you are here with us this evening, because having the ability to move freely and safely in your home is the ultimate master key. Accessibility is probably defined as easy to approach, reach, enter, speak with, or use something or an item. Go ahead, Mandy. OK. Thanks, Stephanie. So accessibility is that key. Accessibility is the key, but finding the key isn't easy. It's a bit of an unknown at times, and what we like to recognize is that it's a, a tug of war between knowing when to adapt your approach or, my, or your environment versus when to rehabilitate or remediate um, using exercises to improve your function or to improve that task. Unfortunately, it's it's really challenging, and I'm sure Stephanie would agree, that to distinguish what is actually maybe the disease process itself and what's contributing to that um, and needs to be modified or adapted to improve the function versus deconditioning, which can be managed or potentially improved through exercise. Um, and to be honest, no one wants to make changes to their approach or to the environment, especially um, in some places personal and intimate as the home. So we recognize that challenge and that tug of war. Um, but recruiting your PT or your OT can help you learn what needs to be adapted and potentially what needs to be remediated and kind of help distinguish that gray area between the two. But I would argue, generally speaking, in most situations, using adaptive tools and exercise or physical activity can improve your accessibility. So throughout this webinar, we'll kind of, between Stephanie and I, we'll go back and forth and talk about ways to adapt activities in your home as well as suggest um, and offer some exercises that can help improve the ease of that particular activity. So accessibility is that master key, and it can be achieved through tools, gadgets, environmental modifications, adaptive technique, exercise, and again, your PT and your OT, one or both of them, are the team members who will help you problem solve the most appropriate tools for those situations. Now, it's, we understand um, that people are often very reluctant and hesitant to think about the potential of using adaptive equipment such as walkers or grab bars, let alone use them. And, and we acknowledge that struggle and we acknowledge that challenge. Um, patients often tell me they feel like the disease is winning. They feel like they failed. They feel like maybe they didn't work hard enough or that they are giving in to their MS. Um, none of this is true. And I would encourage you to rethink how these devices are actually tools that can allow you to take charge of your MS and allow you to do what you want to do and what you can do safely and effectively. All right. So today some of the things that we will be discussing in the rooms that we hope to unlock for you are going to be the bathroom, the kitchen, stairs, and, um, your bedroom, and vehicles also. I know vehicles aren't necessarily in your house, but I'm sure we all need to have a key to that as well. Um, and a lot of you are very um, interested in being able to use your vehicles as well. All right. So I'm going to start off here with um, our bathroom toilet troubles. Um, so I know we won't be able to give everyone's answer to every single thing you want to know in the bathroom, so we picked out a handful of things that we can include in here. Um, some of this equipment is going to look familiar to you. Some of you may have never used it or been taught how to use it or even heard of it. So I've included a couple pictures so you can also see them. Um, for example, the first one I hear is a bedside commode, or they call it a three-in-one sometimes. Um, a bedside commode can either be put over a toilet so you can use the toilet, and that's the picture at the top right corner, um, but it can also be used with a bucket. Some people are unable to access the bathroom itself, so if it's used with a bucket, you can use it in your bedroom or in a common area that you can actually access. The toilet seat razor, which you can see on the bottom right, is attached to the top of the toilet. It elevates the toilet just like the bedside commode would do. It elevates the toilet 
so that you don't have to go down so low to get to the toilet when you're using it. And many of them, as you can see, come with handles attached for increased support when you're pushing up or down. The toilet dater is another option, and you'll see that one at the top right, the picture on the left, it actually just elevates the whole toilet itself, again, for the same reason. Grab bars are always good to have in the bathroom around areas where you're going to be up or down a lot. They just increase your safety when being able to hold on to something. Now, one thing I hear a lot is people have a hard time trying to do their care for their backside after they use the toilet. The days, which most people think, well, we're not in Europe, maybe we don't have them over here. I know they're over there a lot. Um, you can actually get those on Amazon, aftermarket, or on general websites, and just install them onto a regular toilet. It takes away some of the need to reach back and do your cleaning. Um, it might make you safer, keeps your hygiene better, and they're generally not very expensive. I've seen some as much as 30 to $40 um, for the, the lower end, but you could go up to $200 on the high end. So depending what you're looking for, those are some options that you could have. Another thing I did want to mention is getting into bathrooms sometimes is difficult. Um, so if you need to remove some doors to open the doorways, you can hang curtains so the doorways just make it a little bit larger. Um, when you're getting through, you can hang a curtain instead. Um, and removing rugs is another good thing. Having rugs in the house uh, and throughout the bathroom can be a challenge if you're using a wheelchair or a walker. All right, so in here we're going to do a, um, a couple videos, actually. So the first one's going to be um, what I call the sit-to-stand uh, technique for using a toilet. And then another video that we have is what we call a forward transfer. Some people have a hard time transferring in a pivot manner or a slide. We can do a forward transfer onto a toilet. What great ideas. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and now that she's provided you with those ideas, let's chat a little bit about some different examples. Um, certainly not all examples, but rather just a few exercises that might be helpful for some, some toilet troubles. And I just want to say that these exercises and all of these exercises that we chat about tonight um, certainly do not substitute the recommendations of your health care provider, but maybe rather can spark some conversation with maybe your PT or your OT of other ways that you can um, continue to improve your abilities. So some options for strength and skills that you can to, to, uh, expand on in order to improve uh, challenges you may have in the toilet area would be tricep strength. So that upper right hand corner picture is a gal doing some tricep strengthening exercises. The tricep is the muscle on the back of the upper arm and it helps with pushing off the toilet or pushing um, up off of a grab bar to get off of the toilet or to potentially reposition. That's where those triceps come in handy. The sit to stand exercise that you see there is similar to what Stephanie showed you in those videos, the strengthening of those muscles to get on and off the toilet more easily. If you're using this as a training exercise, the height of that chair can be adjusted, increased or decreased uh, to vary that challenge and to um, improve the ability to use varying heights of toilets. So we actually have a couple or one video, excuse me, um, that I call the wipe weight shifting video. All right, so in addition to the toilets in the bathroom, another area where we sometimes struggle are in the tub. Um, so we have some tub trouble. Um, one of the things that we can offer that a lot of people know is um, the tub transfer bench where you sit on it and you slide in and we'll have a minute of video in that, of that in a second. Um, we do have the shower chair which you can use in a walk-in shower and you could step into and maybe sit place, uh, into a chair. Um, those are going to reduce some of your energy. 
use while you're taking your showers. They're going to reduce the risk of fall. Um, and in general, you know, you can be a little more independent with having those. Maybe not have to have someone watching you or standing by as long. Um, we have handheld shower heads. So being able to reach your own shower head and spraying yourself just gives you a little more independence. Grab bars again. I love grab bars. Um, I do usually recommend the installed legit shower bars. I don't generally recommend the suction cup ones. Um, I have had a few people where that is the only option they had because of a rental apartment, um, but I do usually recommend the installed ones. Um, Sometimes we have to remove sliding glass doors. Um, they can be a barrier if you're trying to use um, a tub transfer bench or even just need more room to get around when you're going through in and out the tub. Um, suction cup scrubbers. You see the picture in the center there, um, the circle picture, where you can put a scrubber on the floor and try to scrub your feet with that instead of having to bend down um, or lift your legs up. Or maybe you just don't have the mobility for all of that. And um, hair wash trays. It's the bottom is there. If you can see there's trays you can attach to sinks to wash your hair. Um, if you're not able to get into your shower, or maybe just the shower is a twice a week thing because you can only manage to do it that often with the loved ones that come help you. And in between days, you could do a hair wash tray or something like that. Here's the tub transfer bench and how it's used. along with your tub troubles. I have some ideas for things for adapting your technique, not just modifying your environment. So I usually recommend to people, especially if they have a tub transfer bench or a chair in their shower or tub, uh, dry off and get dressed in that area. Use lots of towels and, and dry everything off that you can. Dress in that area and then when you stand or transfer to get out of that area, you can quickly just bring your clothing up and get into your chair or to your walker. and it, it reduces the energy consumption needed to get up, to transfer out, to transfer somewhere else, to dress somewhere else. When you're showering, if you can bring your legs up into the figure four position, that's like, uh, almost one leg crossed over another, you'll see in a little while a good video of that. Um, it's a great way to wash your feet without having to lean forward. Leaning forward you know, can increase your risk of falls. It might make you dizzy. It might make you lose your, your balance. Um, so if you can bring your legs up, it makes it a little more safe. Wearing slipper socks um, that have the grippies on the bottom or water shoes in the shower for better grip. Those of you who are still able to do some standing in the shower, that also will keep you a little more safe having that traction. Um, and back to the toileting section, I left this in here. We talked about skirts, um, making it easier for you when you're toileting. All great suggestions and ideas. Um, and I want to give you just a snapshot in the, some exercises that may complement what Stephanie is recommending to help improve those functional movements within the tub. Again, not an all-inclusive, but certainly just a taste of some helpful options. So the beloved biceps and tricep muscles. So again, the muscles on the back of the upper arm. We saw the example earlier. And then the biceps are the muscles on the front of the upper arm. Again, they provide the strength for pulling and pushing while seated within the tub to help with the scooting function. Um, hip flexibility, specifically those hip uh, rotators help with crossing the leg in that figure four position, uh, which is a seated position to help wash feet or wash your legs. And we'll show you a video in just a second. Uh, some core strength and sitting balance activities. Um, so core strength includes, we often get this question, what is, core, what is the core strength? What is the core? So core strength includes those muscles of the abdominal and of the back. It's essentially all of the muscles of the trunk. Uh, core strength coupled with sitting balance or standing balance even will help with the endurance and the position, um, positioning and the movement that you need in the shower. Um, a good example is actually just closing your eyes when you're in the shower to wash your face. You have to have good uh, core strength and good balance to sustain that position and be able to uh, do that activity successfully. We'll also show you a video of that in a little bit. Um, lastly is grip strength. Uh, you know, if the soapy, slippery water um, can make even a good grip of someone not impacted by MS 
challenging at times. So if your MS has affected your grip or your fine motor strength, you could, may consider doing some hand exercises like the one uh, shown in the corner here with a, a, a activity ball. Um, and otherwise, sometimes just getting some shower gloves can also be a tremendous help. Here's the figure four position that she demonstrated that will allow you to wash your feet, wash your lower legs in a safe position. But again, having sufficient flexibility for that is important. And the next video is just the gal sitting there with her eyes closed, importance of uh, standing or sitting balance. And then this gal is doing a, a roll-up exercise. And that roll-up exercise, we'll maybe try to play that one one more time for you guys so you can see that. One more. She's uh, tilting her pelvis and rolling back slowly and then rolling back up. I like to use the analogy of like a fruit roll up. You're just unrolling and then rolling back up. Using those abdominal muscles that you would need to, for example, reaching up to get some shampoo or reaching over to a different area. And there was a good example of her st uh, the standing balance required for um, washing your hair, washing your face. But as we wrap up these videos, I think it's just important to comment that tubs and showers are not not the place to um, you know to get fancy or try to practice or develop new skills or strengths. I think if a movement is difficult out of the shower or tub, then it's important to emphasize um, that you need to practice those skills and improve those skills extensively in a safe place before trying them in a real life situation like the the tub or shower. So. Practice those with your rehab team. They'd be happy to help you with those because safety is the priority. All right. And thank you, Mandy. And I really love that figure four stretch. It's one of my favorites for myself, actually. It's a great stretch. So kitchen, cooking quandaries. So I know a lot of people want to be independent in the kitchen. A lot of people want to do their own cooking because food tastes better if you're able to pick how it tastes. Um, so there's a couple things I put in there, some simple things to put in um, to try and help you get more independent in the kitchen. Um, I know I've heard a lot of people ask, well, how can I cook from a wheelchair level or even seated at a chair by my stove because I can't see in the stove top? Well, if you look at the bottom right, there's a picture of a mirror angled above a stove top. Um, angling a mirror over the stove top allows you to see into the uh, pots and pans as you're working. It's a great adaptation so you can see from a seated position. Um, another great thing that I really love, and I love this for everybody, whether you've had MS or not, um, are oven poles, which is the um, center picture on the bottom, and oven um, the guards on the front of the oven also, which you can see on the left here. Now, the uh, oven guards, uh, you can get those again online. You can buy those on, on many websites. Amazon is one where I found them easily. Um, both of these pictures actually came from Amazon. And you can see um, they just eliminate, the guard eliminates the, the risk of a burn because it reduces the temperature there of metal touching your skin if you were to reach in too far. And then the pool actually helps you bring the rack out so you can access it better without having to reach into it. At the top right, you can see there's pull-down cabinets. Um, they're a little more expensive of an option to try and modify your kitchen, but if you have the financial means to do something like that, it is a good option. Um, they can pull down actually pretty low. And you can research online for pull-down cabinets, and you can find very um, different varieties of vendors that can provide such a, a equipment for you. Some more environmental modifications. So we would use some uh, lower storage on countertops. You can see this little corner shelving units maybe to be used to store items. Utilizing drawers and lower cabinets. You know, the things that you don't have to use as often, put them on the top cabinet. If you don't make pie every day, you don't need your pie pan to be in front of you every day. Maybe you need to bring down the cups or the plates or something that you use every day. So think about where you're putting the most frequently used items. I love magnetic spice containers. Um, these 
uh, spice and tears you can actually get at Walmart and Target and, and your just everyday stores that you would go to. Um, you can buy them online and, and they're really good magnetic um, pieces. You can either put them on a metal frame or you can actually put them uh, on your refrigerator just to make it easier to reach them. And I do recommend often to get lightweight um, and dishwasher safe dishware because it just it makes it easier for managing them and cleanups easier. So let's save that energy as best as possible. So some more options are um, if again if you have the financial means to make bigger changes, install shallow sinks. Um, deep sinks make it difficult to reach all the way down in to wash items. Having a shallow sink makes it a little easier to reach from a seated position. So if you're in a wheelchair or if you're bringing a chair over to sit down to wash dishes, that will make it a little easier. Um, and if you look down on the bottom two pictures, um, you can cut out a space underneath your um, your sink area so you can roll a chair, a wheelchair up or uh, bring a chair closer to it. Um, or you can at least pull out the front doors and put in curtains just to allow you to get a little closer underneath. Now I know some people are wondering, well, I, I don't know how to modify that and I, I can't uh, afford maybe to pay someone to do that. Um, there are always, you know, contractors you can look for. And when you're looking for contractors, um, I do usually recommend to look for a contractor who knows um, the ADA guidelines or is familiar with aging in place. If you talk to a contractor, bring up those words and look for the information that, that they're going to give you and see how receptive they are to that. So here's some techniques uh, to make cooking a little bit easier. I highly recommend slow cookers and pressure cookers. Um, they just make it easier to do things. They can be done without so much attention and time and energy consumed. And what's really nice is if you use slow cookers, you can put those plastic liners inside of it and it's almost nothing for cleanup. So you have just um, cooked dinner and cleaned up in, in much less time. Um, work on lower surfaces. If you are working better seated at a kitchen table, prep all your food seated at the kitchen table. Don't stand at a countertop prepping your food if you're fatiguing and losing your energy. Use food processors to prepare your food. And when you're trying to move things around a room or through the kitchen, a nice rolling cart like you see on the bottom right here can come in, uh, come in handy really well because you can place tons of items on it and bring it around uh, without having to challenge balance. Great suggestions. So in addition to those adaptations that Stephanie recommended, there are some strengths and skills that can be developed. So um, in addition to some of the previously mentioned core exercises, some strengths and skills that you may need in the kitchen that can either be completed in a seated or standing position may include some balance activities. And some of those balance activities may involve reaching overhead um, or out to, to your sides with varying rate weights and varying um, sizes of objects to simulate pots and pans or manipulating bowls. I also think it's really essential to note that um, the kitchen is generally a place where a lot of multitasking occurs. You know, it's a place where, where balance needs to be working for you when you're not necessarily thinking about it. So a, a good and a functionally applicable exercise would involve you maybe standing or sitting um, and completing balance while you're reading a recipe or while you're manipulating ingredients. That would be a good strategy. And lastly, um, arm strengthening, of course, is important because you do a lot of your kitchen activities using your arms. Uh, also notable is the fact that the kitchen is a place um, I often encourage to trigger reminders for exercises. Um, I often encourage people to, to sprinkle their exercises throughout the day, especially those folks who suffer from a, a fair amount of fatigue. And because we generally are in the kitchen, you know, at least three times a day for our meals, it may be a good place to tie an exercise or tie some exercises uh, to activities that you might be doing in the kitchen, such as maybe when the coffee's brewing, for example. You could do your calf stretches, or when there's food heating in the microwave, maybe you can do some abdominal exercises or some wall push-ups, but using the, the kitchen activities as a reminder for other exercises. And lastly, the, the kitchen can get hot, real hot. And I, <laughs> I think as little as a tenth of a degree is what some of the research suggests. Um, increase in your core body temperature may influence your MS symptoms and thus your overall ability to perform activities in the kitchen. 
So I would encourage you to consider some of the cooling products that you may incorporate into other parts of your life to maybe consider these while you're working in the kitchen and while you are cooking. So we're going to go back up to the balance uh, section and have uh, Brian show us a quick video of a gal doing some standing arm strengthening exercise. Thanks, Brian. All right, so on to the bedroom. Um, organization obstacles. Now, I will admit, this is an obstacle with my bedroom in my life, so I need to try and stop being a hypocrite and telling people, keep your obstacles clear and keep your room clean, because it is hard. It's really hard to keep it up when you're in and out of a room so much. But here's some ideas that might help you um, keep your environment a little easier to manage. Um, Say if your support partner um, is able to take all of the drawers that are uh, maybe too low or maybe too high. Can you guys um, share two dressers and is it easier for you to reach the bottom drawers and then your support partner has the top drawers? Um, and can you lower closet bars? So often bars can be lowered um, to a reachable area. That will reduce a lot of energy than not needing to stand up to pull down clothing. Um, they do have adjustable clothing racks. You can see on the bottom right picture here, there's um, a rack that actually pulls down on a hinge um, if you don't want to adjust it to the lower setting. Um, this is just a little more pricey of an option. Just lowering the bar might be the, the cheaper version of doing that. Um, Installed shelves. Um, they just make things a little easier to access, too, having shelves at a lower area. Uh, you don't have to open drawers and pull drawers back and, and bring them close to your body. It's a little less dynamic. Can you remove your closet doors? A lot of times, closet doors and pulling them back can increase the risk of your balance. Putting um, a curtain over the door, it, it looks fashionable, um, and taking the closet door itself off might need to make it easier for you to access the closet. And in the room, if you can, take out the carpet. If you're deciding, oh, well, maybe I'm going to put in a brand new carpet, or maybe I'm going to do hardwood, hardwood would be easier. Carpet soaks up that energy, and we are doing everything we can do to save every ounce of energy that you can during the day um, on little things, and that carpet can be one of those things. All right, so one of my little favorite OT pictures there. Everybody always comes out of that one. Um, when you're reaching for clothing, can you use different um, devices? Can you use different techniques? Um, so like clothing during times when you have more energy. Is, is your time of day when you have the most energy in the morning? Then pick out your clothes in the morning and set them aside. If you feel like you have more energy, maybe in the afternoon, pick out your clothes for the next day and set them aside. Um, keep your most frequently used clothing in the most accessible spaces, just like we said in the kitchen. If it's um, the same shoes you use every day, put them where they're easy to access. If they're your snow boots that you only use three months out of the year, maybe they don't need to be right up in the front, making a little obstacle to get to the shoes you do use more. Use your reachers. I love reachers. So if you have a reacher to get items overhead, you can use them even for things up on the floor and shoes and other objects. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. I think I'm inspired to do some modifications to my bedroom, so thank you. <laughs> let's, uh, let's chat briefly now about some of the additional mobility challenges that maybe physical therapists might um, face um, or that you might problem solve with your PT in the bedroom. First, I would encourage if you're someone who has a bit more trouble or walking uh, excuse me, walking or moving in the mornings because of maybe spasticity or perhaps you experience considerable fatigue in the evenings, please, please explore other options for walking aids or mobility aids um, for that given time of day. I think um, having a variety of options for assistive devices can be very helpful. You're not married to one assistive device and you can have many options um, for the situations that you need within your home. As far as fall risks go, um, bedrooms, I would say, in addition to bathrooms, are perhaps the most common places for falls. One of the challenges um, that I hear most often in the clinic is that if you are an AFO wear or an ankle brace wear um, to help manage, for example, foot drop, you may not necessarily have your brace yawn on yet when you're in the bath in the bedroom. Excuse me. And inherently, uh, not having that brace on in the bedroom may place you at an increased risk for falls, especially if it's first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening. 
So I would just encourage you to be very cognizant of when you put on and take off your AFO and try to make that the first thing you do in the morning and perhaps the last thing you do at night. And if that's not possible, um, certainly have other strategies in place to provide you extra support to ensure your safety. Um, and lastly, I would just encourage you to have a good, clear, well-lit path to the bathroom at night to minimize uh, fall risk and minimize any trip hazards that you might have. And you know, Mandy, I really like the, uh, the lighting input because um, there's actually some great things I've heard recently some of my um, clients have been telling me about is they have some of those cool gadgets, those fancy things where you can talk to them in your house and tell them to turn on lights for you. And I found they've come in really handy for some people. Wonderful input. Thank you. So another area is getting in and out of bed, tiresome transfers. Are you exhausted by the end of the night and then you're ready to get in bed and just looking at that bed like it's Mount Pedrid? Um It can be a big hurdle. So some of the things I usually recommend are um, you can install bed rails. So there's a picture at the top right here of a simple bed rail. Again, you can buy them online. You can buy them at your local um, uh, medical supply stores often. And they slide between the bed and the box spring, and they have ways to secure down. Now, depending on how much weight you're putting into them, you want to consider the make of them. There's some more cheaper ones that don't give a ton of support, but give you a little. And then there's ones that are a lot more sturdy. One thing that I do highly recommend to people is if you do have that bed that is Mount Everest, and it's nearly as high as my kitchen counters, which I've seen, lower your bed. Uh, we don't need to be climbing up to the top to get into bed at night. Lowering your bed isn't very difficult if you if you have somebody that can make some changes for you. Um, sometimes just taking the box spring out and putting those wood slats underneath, like in the bottom right, you can have the bed straight onto those slats, um, and it can reduce a lot of the height. Um, you can purchase thin box springs. They do have the thinner ones available. They're nearly half the size of a full box spring. Um, some people have even gone as far as turning the legs off of the frames of their beds. So if you have a wooden bed that has some pretty um, large uh, legs, you could have them trimmed down and lower the bed. But if you can reduce the height of your bed, I highly recommend that if you do have a, a mountain-sized bed. So then we can also adapt our technique, all right? So um, one of the things I really like is some people use uh, leg lifters to help them get in bed. And what it does is it elevates um, your foot for you if you don't have the lower extremity strength to bring them up. Right, so other things you can do is you can put a plastic bag um, under your feet to help slide your feet across the bed if that's another challenge for you. Um, and sleep on the side that is easiest to transfer to and from. If you're finding that space is too tight on one side or just transferring in that direction is difficult, switch with a support partner and see if you can um, access the bed any better there. And I love this little uh, cartoon here where at the end, you know, he wants to get a piggyback ride right before bed every night. And I don't want you guys to have to have a piggyback ride activities before you can get into your bed every night. Let's try and make it so that we can find ways for you guys to get in bed easier. That plastic bag is a great, great suggestion and a great idea. Thank you for giving us that little nugget of wisdom. So. Now, having sufficient core strength and, and trunk range of, mo range of motion is a key, I would argue, to successful transfers, particularly in and out of bed. Um, exercises that might help improve the ease of memo bed mobility and transfers can include trunk rotations, and we'll see a video of that in just a bit, as they can help you with rolling. And as you guessed it, as there's a theme with these exercises, more core and abdominal exercises will be helpful. So we're going to actually see three videos here that demonstrate some core strengthening exercises and some lumbar range of motion exercises that can help with transitioning to and from the laying down position and the edge of your bed. Okay, and then the other way.
All right, so stairs. Stairs, another Mount Everest that some of us are looking at every day, wondering how am I going to get up those. Um, consider stair lifts. I know many of you have seen stair lifts um, and thought about them before, but I know they're pricey usually, and that's a concern with a lot of things. Um, I did learn recently that you can buy used stair lifts. That, that is an option, and they sometimes will come with uh, warranties. So if you do get a used stair lift, I do recommend getting it with a warranty, and the companies can actually install those for you. Um, you can also install ramps outside to make it easier to access from the house. Um, and just so you know, there are some ADA guidelines when you're installing ramps. For every one inch of height you need to go up, you should go 12 inches of ramp length. I know it sounds like a lot, and it does end up being a lot. And even in addition to that, after 30 feet of ramp length, you should have five by five landing to take a break because it's exhausting getting up 30 feet. 30 foot of ramp length. Um, install extra railings. If you only have one on your stair well, maybe add a second one to make it easier coming up and down in different directions. Provide areas for rest midway. And you can see in that picture on the bottom right, there's a little chair on the landing. Maybe you need to make it halfway, sit and take a break, and then make it the other half just to allow yourself to rest in between. And something actually to help out our support partners is to have a second wheelchair if it's possible. Keep it at the top of the stairs. Carrying a wheelchair up and down the stairs every time can be exhausting. And we need to realize that our support partners need to conserve their energy a little bit too. So simple tasks like carrying a, a wheelchair up and down the stairs is going to fatigue them. So having a chair at the top can conserve some of their energy as well. We're going to adapt our technique also. I have two videos we're going to play in a minute here. I, I get a kick out of this cartoon also. It's an early model stairmaster. Um, <laughs> I bet it feels like a workout getting up there sometimes. And, uh, and, and I, I feel like even some days I look at the stairs thinking, geez, how many times have I gone up these today in the hospital? So just imagining trying to go up those stairs once and feeling that fatigue is, is very intimidating. Um, so we have the option to bump up and down the stairs sitting on your bottom if you're able to get a sit-to-stand transfer from like a, a lower surface. Um, and then there's also the option to sidestep up and down the stairs. But limit the times you need to go up and down the stairs. Having items that you need organized so you're not doing extra up and down, up and down. So we'll watch two videos, um, the different techniques you can use to get up and down the stairs. So here's a side step to get up the steps sideways. So we're going to head right into driving here. Modifying your environment. So modifying with hand controls if you're losing um, some strength possibly in your lower extremities. Maybe you don't have the sensation you had before, um, and maybe the coordination in your lower extremities isn't quite there anymore. These are some of the modifications you can use. There's the hand controls in the top right, and you can see the spinner knob, and there's hand controls for the gas and the uh, brake. Um, on the left side, on the bottom, they actually have the little switch that comes up and across there is um, a turn signal adapter. So if you maybe don't have as much control with um, your left hand to manage a, a turn signal or your, or your right hand, you can have these adapters for um, the lights and the turn signals and items switch to the same side so you can use them with one hand. Another nice little fancy gadget I've seen is the car chain. Um, and those you can use, uh, you just, you can see it's kind of hooked into the metal bracket there and just kind of support your hand there to push up. And there's different options you'll see for different uh, lifts and wheelchair access. Um, this all kind of depends on what your needs are. You know, sometimes 
Um, you do have the financial means to be able to buy one of these uh, super fancy vans. Um, and if you do, just consider where you're loading and unloading most often and how accessible your environment will be to get in and out. So adapting your technique, um, when you get in and out of your car, um, make sure you sit into the car and then bring your feet in. I see many people try to step in and then climb into their car. It's scary. Sit to the seat and bring your feet in. We'll see a video in a second. You can use a plastic bag on the seat to help you slide a little bit better. And another option is the slide board transfers. And there's a video, two videos you'll see here that are going to demonstrate both of those for you. Now this one is another option. This is with a slide board. And lastly, what are some strengths or skills that could be incorporated to improve your ability to drive. Now, it's fair to say that the act of driving involves a lot of skills, uh, the use of the arms, your core, potentially legs, depending upon how you approach driving. But regardless of those driving adaptations, we all use our head and neck and our eyes. We all, have, uh, we all need to have sufficient range of motion in our neck muscles to be able to turn, to check traffic, or even to adjust the air conditioning or radio. Um, I will talk to the specific neck stretch that you see pictured first. This is a chin tuck stretch. And it's, what it's doing is elongating the muscles on the back of the neck. And it, it helps to counteract that preferred forward head and neck posture that many of us have while we're driving or while we're at, uh, working at a computer. But having that neck range of motion can help with turning, can help with looking side to side, can help with looking up and down. And then going back now to the first bullet about the visual motor function involved with driving, this, this involves the ability of your eye muscles to move and to track properly both when your head is still as well as when your head is uh, turning or moving. And I'll chat briefly and then we're going to show this video that you can see now about a vestibular exercise or a gaze stabilization exercise that can help with improving the reflex between your inner ear, your brain, and your eye muscles that allows your vision to stay focused while you're moving or turning your head. And what can happen is you can have weakness um, within the inner ear or perhaps along the pathway um, between the inner ear and the brain because of an MS lesion that can contribute to that gaze instability. Patients. Um, often describe it as kind of a bad home movie sensation or things are kind of lagging or delayed when they turn or move their head. That may be suggestive of, of some gaze instability and an exercise like what you just saw may be appropriate. So uh, clearly, and th there's no pun intended, the ability to focus <laughs> um, visually is a really important driving skill. Sorry. Okay. So we'll just wrap up with a few closing slides here before we open up to questions. So um, you must all be thinking, wow, this is great, but I need this money tree in my backyard to help pay for what these ladies are suggesting may make my life easier and more accessible. And we acknowledge without, <laughs> without a doubt a tree like this would be ideal, but there are some more realistic options. Um, so we'll just list a few here for you. One is uh, vocational rehab. So if you're someone who um, works from home, vocational rehab is a state-funded organization that helps people access their workplace. Um, so vocational rehab may be able to help with some modifications within your home to help you keep working. Secondly, your rehabilitation team, so your PT and your OT in combination with your physicians and your nurse practitioners may be able to help justify um, with letters and recommendations and prescriptions to private insurances and to Medicare or Medicaid um, what um, uh, modifications are, are necessary and appropriate. Flexible spending accounts and health savings accounts can be used to spend on equipment. 
Um, and it's also important to note that if you do invest your own money to modify your home, that those um, could potentially be used as a tax deduction. So talk with your tax advisor and accountant. Um, Stephanie spoke about earlier about seeking used equipment, um, used equipment online, eBay, Craigslist, things like that may have options available to you. And then certainly reach out to, to your social networks such as churches or any other uh, social organizations you may belong to. But most importantly, um, I would encourage all of you to uh, reach out to the National MS Society. And the number for that is 1-800-FIGHT-MS. And when you call that number, you can be put in contact with an MS navigator who is someone who can put you in touch with your and, and make you aware of the local resources that may be available to you and that could help you with some of these modifications. And lastly, always, 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 always engage and involve your healthcare team when you're considering any modifications, large or small. You know, nowadays with the current healthcare environment, money is, is very limited, even if you have good insurance. And you don't want to be using or uh, exhausting all of your benefits or using your own hard-earned money on modifications um, that are not the most appropriate and the most suitable for you in your situation. So use your healthcare team. So hopefully we've got you thinking about modifications and got you thinking about other ways that you can unlock and make your home more accessible and more comfortable to you. So hopefully you've learned that you can allow yourself permission to use these tools and that these tools can help you take charge of your MS. That you can also use your team, your occupational therapist and your physical therapist to help you identify and problem solve situations that may be challenging in your home. And hopefully you also learn that you can practice extensively with, you, with your team these situations um, to make them easier and make them more comfortable when you do put, put them into action. We also think it's important to have a couple sets of keys. And when we say keys, we, we, we know we've shown you a few options for tackling a variety of challenges within your home, but we also acknowledge that we haven't shown you all of them. MS is highly individualized and there is no one-size-fits-all approach. So having um, a variety of options can help improve your overall success and comfort in your home. And lastly, sometimes um, you have to change the locks and just simply get new keys. You know, MS is, is challenging and it can change day to day, hour to hour, and acknowledging and, and having options for a variety of circumstances can help you be more comfortable in your home. MS, uh, a prog uh, MS progression or perhaps an MS relapse can turn, you know, even the best plan upside down. And in that case, um, you know, we encourage you to change the locks, re-engage your healthcare team, and come up with a new strategy. So well, everybody, we really want you to enjoy your home. Home is where the heart is, and you guys should be happy in your home, and you shouldn't be fighting your home. So find ways with, like Mandy said, with, uh, with your support partners, with your therapy team, with your social network. Find ways to make your home where your heart is again. All righty. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Mandy, for that great information uh, and helping us paying attention to our environment and uh, adapting some new techniques and, and finding some exercises to help us uh, enhancing those techniques. So um, lots of really great information out there, and I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, again, we will email you a copy of all the slides as well as the article that Stephanie and Mandy uh, have written, and uh, you can go back and, and watch the archive version uh, if you miss anything, and we'll talk about some more resources um, that, that's available to you. But we do have a few minutes uh, for questions here. Um, thank you for, for participating and sending in those questions, and uh, we only have a few minutes left, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and so the first question, uh, we, we received these uh, from a lot of people, and um, you know, when you're thinking about buying a new home or renovating a house or, or installing some new features, um, you know, it's inherently a, a long-term commitment and an expensive commitment, um, while MS, conversely, is a very unpredictable disease. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the balance of when you're looking into some of these modifications, um, the balance between what you need now um, versus uh, the need to plan for what some of the changes in, in the disease 
and anticipating uh, what may be coming down the line? That's a great question. Um, Mandy, do you mind if I start? No, go right ahead. Um, I do, I hear this a lot coming from many people. Um, how much do I do off of that? How much do I start with? How far do I go? Um, I, it, it depends on the size of the, the change you're going to make. Um, I have many people who go, I'm taking out my entire bathtub and I'm going to put in a walk, a roll-in shower. Well, right now, do you need to or are you safe enough with a tub transfer bench? Um, you know, that makes it pretty safe and pretty easy to get into. And do you need to modify somewhere else a little bit more to start? Do you need to work in the kitchen maybe to start? Um, but when you do make those big changes and when it comes to that point, I do usually recommend that people consider what their changes could be. I'd like to hope that nobody's going to progress any farther in their MS and that they will uh, only get better, but we can't guarantee that. So when you are making changes and you know you're going to invest a lot of money into something like a whole bathroom remodel, do remodels in the way that you would expect maybe down the road to possibly be. So instead of just pulling out a tub and putting a walk-in shower, would you want to put in a roll-in shower option instead in case you ever need to? Um, so, so those are some of the ideas. Um, Mindy, I don't know if you have any others you'd like to add. No, that's a wonderful, wonderful comment. And I, we have a, a psychologist that works with CanDo, and if any of you have um, participated in webinars and seen some in-person programs, she often says this. She says, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So in other words, I think um, planning and prioritizing what your, your current needs are, and then talking with your healthcare team and your loved ones, about what you might think might be a priority for the future. None of us have a crystal ball, but I think if we if we plan and we structure it in such a way that it, um, modifications can build up on one another, um, if necessary, then that's often kind of a, a strategic way to go about large home modifications. I think those are some great points. Um, so thank you both. Um, on that note, we have a lot of support partners uh, on the call, um, and we actually got a, a couple from, from both sides. And um, Can you talk a little bit about how uh, support partners can balance uh, the need to, to help and ensure the safety of, of their loved ones um, while also providing room for independence? Um, and uh, you know, we, get, we got a couple comments from people that family members insist that they're present uh, at all times to help. Um, any tips for support partners in, in, in balancing these, these sometimes conflicting uh, emotions? Certainly. Do you want me to take this one first, Stephanie? Sure. Okay. I often um, coach uh, people with MS and their support partners to to outline the situations where where the person living with MS needs help, thinks they need help, and then the support partner does the same when the situations when they think they need help. See where there are, are similarities and see where there are differences. Talk through those challenges um, and see if there are ways that the situation can be adapted to make both parties feel safer and more comfortable if that's what's necessary. But I think recognizing those situations when safety is compromised and if it can be adapted in such a way that the person can do it independently, do that. Um, I also think that it's appropriate to say that there are, are, for the person living with MS, to say there are times when I want to be able to do this activity by myself. I know I can do this safely. I know I can do it by myself. Um, there are plenty of other opportunities when you can help me. But I think those situations have to be uh, agreed upon. And, and often having kind of that neutral party and that objective person being a member of the rehab team um, to help facilitate that conversation, it can often go a bit more smoothly. Oh, that's great. And I also think, like, even if you're talking about one situation, like, I know a big one is the bathroom. Most people want to go to the bathroom by themselves. An audience is weird. Um, so being able to use the bathroom by yourself, if that's something you feel like you can do, maybe sit down and write a list. Okay, why do you, what, what makes you worried about me in the bathroom? Write that list. Or, or what are you worried about in the bathroom? And then kind of, like, maybe next to that list, think of, okay, so how can we resolve that, that concern? What are options? So, so I think that's a great way. It's just really communication. No, I think that's a great point, and um, certainly it's a it's it's a journey for for both the support partner and the person with MS. 
Um, but conversely, we got a question from, from one person that um, about living alone um, and with MS and with, um, with some balance and, uh, and accessibility issues. Any um, uh, additional recommendations or, or measures uh, specifically for, for those people living by themselves um, that don't have support partners um, that, that maybe they could um, consider um, w with their home accessibility? I definitely do think, um, and, and Mandy chimed in at any point too, but um, I do recommend, especially people who are living at home because of the risk for falls, um, something like, uh, I guess you call it the life alert or some type of alarm system. And a lot of people are even opting now to, to do, uh, we have cell phones on watches now. We can wear our cell phones. Um, I've heard many people say, just having my Apple Watch or my Google Watch or whatever all those fancy things are, I don't even know all of them. Um, those can come in handy too for, for just concerns when you need help and stuff like that. But uh, the life alerts and other ones that uh, have a fall alarm that can sense a fall um, are really good. I do highly recommend something like that in the house. I would completely agree with everything you just commented on. And just plan plan for maybe erring on the side of, of having more safety measures in place that may or may not be necessary. Mm -hmm. Having a family great. member that checks in on you once in a while, that's a great one too. Somebody that calls and just to see how you're doing every day and make sure you're you're up and moving and things like that. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie, we got a, a few questions about recommended heights of, of various features. I want to just ask you about two of them. Um, first, in the shower, um, if they were going to put in a handheld uh, shower head, what would be the recommended height? And then also in the kitchen, uh, if a person is in a wheelchair, what would be the recommended um, height to, to help with, uh, with stoves? Or do you have any um, suggestions specifically for how to be in a wheelchair, but also use a regular height stove? Two-part question. Hey. So yes, yeah, so one of the ones that um, the, the shower heads, and it was back in the slides, so I, whoever asked that question, please feel free to pop back in the slides and look at this later. Um, there's a shower head, a handheld um, shower head, that actually has an adjustable height. You can change it up and down. Um, so I do recommend one like that, because you can bring it to the lowest height if you're teeny tiny, um, or you can bring it up to a higher height if you're really tall. Um, sometimes you can even take those shower heads, and some of them you can put a little hook on and use a suction cup on the side of the wall, and just hang it wherever you'd like when it comes time to hang it. Um, so that makes it just a little more personalized. Um, and that's custom to each person. I wouldn't say there's a standard height to that one. Now, um, you might have caught me not remembering my numbers exactly for the counter mm -hmm. heights. Um, so I do recommend if you go um, online and search um, ADA height, so that's uh, American Disabilities Act heights. I know they have standards on there, and that's where I got the height, uh, the ramp lengths and all of that from as well. Um, What's interesting is I recently found out that some states actually have a little bit uh, more stringent rules on things. Um, but as far as counter heights, you can find um, all those different heights and levels for um, kitchen surfaces and bedroom surfaces and things like that in um, ADA's websites. Great. Thank you very much. And we have time for a couple more. Um, Mandy, we had one writer ask for exercises that specifically address uh, weak or numb hands or numb hands? That's a good question. You know, I think it's important to be certain what the cause of the weakness or the numbness of the in the hands is. And I bring that up, up because sometimes um, it's lots of things. It's easy to just blame it on the MS. Um, and it may not necessarily be secondary to the MS if there's any uh, cervical issues, neck issues, maybe a disc herniation or a pinched nerve or some um, arthritis in the neck that can contribute to some of that as well. So um, that can change the approach for what um, exercises and interventions may be most appropriate. So I think my best advice for that particular participant would be to um, make sure you d you're able to distinguish the cause of that, of that symptom, those symptoms rather. And certainly yeah, I agree, Mandy. consulting our health care team. Yep. 
And maybe at that time it might mean uh, maybe some adaptations would be important too. Mm -hmm. Building up handles on utensils, on your uh, your toothbrush, on uh, forks and knives, um, you know, things like that might help. Maybe button hooks, things that can make it a little easier to manage those small things. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Stephanie, you showed some great pictures about uh, with uh, outdoor ramps um, and outdoor grab bars. Uh, have you had any experience or any advice as far as um, people having trouble with permits or difficulties with rental properties? Any suggestions on um, on those types of obstacles, um, or or if, is that not something you, you normally see in your practice? And then people are it, it's a pretty smooth process. Um, you know, I haven't had anybody have issues getting ramps or anything like that. You know, if you are, if there's some reason they need to be digging, obviously you need to contact your utility services in the area first. Um, but you know, making sure I, you do do in everywhere I've ever been, you do require permits in the area. I don't think it's usually a challenge, though. Um, so, so that shouldn't be um, too big of a problem. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? The permits uh, with, and then with rental properties. Um, oh yes. That is a challenge often. Um, and, and you know, there are some rights that you have. Um, and if things have changed since you've had that rental property, you know, again, go to the ADA website and search on their website what your rights are um, as a renter and what adaptations uh, might be allowed or permitted. Um, you know, so some rental agencies don't want to make permanent changes. And like I said, I don't usually recommend things like suction cup grips, but if that's the only option and it seems to be holding well enough for you and you've had someone else test it, that might be something you might have to do for a little bit. Um, a lot of times renters don't you know, have the means to be able to do huge modifications like open doorways and take out walls and things like that. Um, so they, that, that can be a bigger challenge. And I, I do say that is a, a, a something I hear often is, is the rental properties. I would also say that um, my experience has been the, having just an open conversation with those rental, they want to keep that, that apartment occupied or that house occupied. So especially if you're a good renter, they're, they're, they're often willing to work with, yeah. with people and try to kind of find a, mil, a middle ground too. So, and if it's not, there's not a middle ground, then there's got to be a better option you know, out there. Right. Well, uh, we have time for one more question, and um, uh, Mandy mentioned this on a, a few slides ago, but uh, any other thoughts on uh, resources or um, programs or agencies uh, that may help uh, with some of these, removing some of these uh, barriers, um, finding funding, finding um, organizational strategies, or um, you know, any, any other directions that, that you would point um, participants to to, to move forward with some of these ideas? Yeah, you know, I, I honestly, I, I, I really think you're, given the geography of, of our um, listening audience this evening, um, reaching out to the National MS Society and that MS Navigator at 1-800-FIGHT-MS is a great place to start. And I would also say, you know, speaking with a social worker, if you have access to a social worker, if that, if you don't have access to that healthcare professional, your PT and your OT are um, are pretty good resources for other um, other local nonprofits or um, government funding agencies within within your area. So I would, again, reach out to your healthcare provider and have them help you do that digging. Um, most of them are quite knowledgeable of those types of things. All right. And well, another thank big you. thing. Oh, oh go ahead, Stephanie. Go ahead. All right. And then a big thing is, like we said earlier, reach out to your social networks. You know, reach out to friends. Reach out to family. If you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, if there's anything you need, let me know. They usually genuinely mean it. They want to help. So if you know a friend who's a contractor and, you know, maybe 10 people at your, your church or, or the Boy Scout group for your child or something like that are willing to always help out, maybe together they could help with you building a ramp or something like that. So your social networks are a huge support for you and accept the help that people are willing to offer. Absolutely. Taking the initiative to ask uh, goes a long way. And uh, we appreciate the initiative of everyone uh, to, for joining us tonight. And hopefully you got some, some great information. And we really appreciate Stephanie and Mandy uh, taking their time uh, to share their expertise and some of their ideas 
Um, we really appreciate having everyone this evening. Uh, I do want to tell you about a few more resources that are available to you uh, that you may want to take advantage of. Uh, on the CanDo MS website, which again is mscando.org, uh, you will find all of our archived webinars um, as well as our library articles, including one written by Stephanie and Mandy that's uh, on the website right now. Uh, we also have uh, an e-news uh, monthly newsletter that uh, you can receive by email. And we have our Ask the Can Do team, uh, and this is an opportunity for you to submit a, a question, and we will do our best to get it answered by our team of MS Care experts. Uh, so definitely take advantage of those Can Do MS uh, resources, and also the National MS Society um, has some great resources dealing with uh, accessibility and falls. Um, they have a lot of videos as well as online brochures. Uh, they have really great uh, networking uh, and connection opportunities. Uh, so please take advantage of uh, everything that the MS Society has to offer on their website. And as Mandy mentioned, um, if you dial 1-800-FIGHT-MS, you can get, uh, get a hold of a navigator that can really help you uh, with your uh, individualized needs and, and point you in the right direction. So we certainly take, ask you to take advantage of that. And then uh, please join us uh, every month uh, on the second Tuesday. We have our webinar and telelearning series, and we try to find uh, a lot of different topics. Uh, so our next webinar will be on Tuesday, July 11th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the topic will be resilience uh, with a renowned psychologist and a certified wellness coach uh, discussing the strategies that you can employ to help you cope day to day. This will be an informative and impactful presentation for both people living with MS and their support partners. Uh, so we hope you can join us again, and as always, you can register for the webinar free of charge on the CanDo MS website, mscando.org. For those of you participating live tonight, you will see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and share your input. Your, fee your feedback helps us continue to improve our webinar and telelearning series. Uh, you will also receive a PDF copy of tonight's slides by email. Uh, so we certainly do appreciate you joining us this evening, and thank you for your patience with, uh, with some of the videos. We know they were choppy, but uh, we're a small nonprofit, and we do what we can do. So um, we, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, finally, uh, we can only provide these free educational programs through the generous donations of our participants. Uh, so if you enjoyed the presentation tonight and would like to see similar programs, uh, please consider do donating to Can Do MS. You can simply text your donation to 970. 626-6232, or again, visit our website, mscando.org. So again, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Stephanie and Mandy. And I hope everyone has a great evening.